security has three elements. One is reliability, the second is affordability, and the third element is environmental sustainability. If you look at most of the presentation of the Israeli experts, you see the great emphasis on on only on reliability, energy island, uh, and energy disruptions, energy dangers, right? But on the other hand, in order to sustain an economy, in order to sustain a population, in order to sustain public health, you have to look at energy security as the three elements, again, uh, of, uh, of reliability, affordability, and environmental sustainability. I would like to talk about specifically what are the risks in terms of reliability of supply, uh, especially in the cases of oil and gas. And I think maybe we'll come out with a little bit more nuanced picture um, about how how reliable oil and gas supplies are and how often they are used, so, so <coughs> disruptions are used for political goals. Um, one in terms of uh, oil supplies. Um, I think Israel and many a number of countries are sort of stuck in the 1970s when there were, were there was even that, uh, when, when many, up into the 1970s when uh, many of supplies were between countries, were long-term contracts. Oil today is a completely commercial transaction. Only minority of the contracts are, with, are within, uh, between countries or in long-term long -term supplies. And the market provides oil. Even the 1970s, there was no embargo. Oil got to every consumer that wanted to consume, to consume oil. The only problem with the, in the 1970s was actually the price of oil, which is connected to the tight oil market, and a lot less about uh, uh, ge geopolitics. But even today, the oil market is even more commercial than in the 1970s. And even today, only 40% of oil is supplied by OPEC uh, producers. So mo most, most of the supplies today are by, by non-OPEC non producers, and they're not coordinated, and they don't coordinate their policies with oil. So today, the idea of an oil weapon, if at all, it's in the hands of the consumers. The only countries that successfully use the oil weapon is actually when countries band together and target the ener investments in the energy sector or take away markets from energy exporters such as Sudan, Iran, Iraq, Libya. And in fact, there really we have no cases of successful embargoes of, of the uh, consumers. Natural gas is uh, fundamentally different. Natural gas, because of the way, the fact that it's gas, it's transported primarily in pipelines or in LNG, and, and, and LNG is liquefied natural gas. In a sense, it's a floating pipeline because of the great expenses on both sides. It's also sold in long-term contracts. And here, you could say, well, there is, this could be the place for the energy weapon, for the gas weapon. But even here, the, the picture is a lot more uh, uh, nuanced. First, again, in most cases, the, the uh, exporter needs the market as more, more than maybe even more than the consumer needs, needs the gas. And it's only when places when there's a big gap between, there's no, no symmetry between the need of the, the, the market and the need of the consumer and the importer, do we have even the chance of a so-called energy weapon or using disruptions uh, to, to promote foreign policy goals. And in fact, we have very few cases in the history of the trade of natural gas of intentional supply disruptions that are intended to achieve political goals. And in fact, we should be very careful not to learn from the post-Soviet example, because all of you are probably saying, wait, wait, what's she talking about? Ukraine, Georgia. These are extremely, um, extremely irregular uh, uh, situations. When an empire breaks up, domestic pipelines become international pipelines. And in the unraveling of these relations, of course, it's going to be, there are going to be a, a sort of re very extreme situations. For instance, a country like Georgia having 100% of its electricity and its natural gas from one supplier. And a domestic, as a domestic transaction between Moscow and Tbilisi, this made sense. Between two independent countries, this kind of mix of 100% supply of electricity and natural gas from one source could not develop. And so we really shouldn't learn from these cases where um, it's much more connected to the unraveling of an empire, not something that's re relevant for any other cases. Much better to look at cases like Germany, Russia, uh, 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 to, to learn from the long terms, how, for instance, over f almost 40 years, when you can go from Soviet Union, from the Cold War, to to uh, to detente, to the to the end of detente, through the breakup of this, through perestroika, through the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, through the through the renewal of uh, 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 of uh, Eastern and Western Germany, and at the same time, what not one day of intentional supply disruption. We should learn about from these cases as much as we can learn about from from Russia, Georgia, or or in fact more. Um, and another thing is that we have to remember that interconnection doesn't bring interdependency. And uh, while, while, the, while the pipelines are very, supply disruptions are very rarely used in order to promote uh, political goals, they're also not very good at building peace. And this is also, I think, an idea uh, often in Israel, there's these, uh, just, just, I think, just is that we like, very, we like these very dramatic, uh, to, to, to focus on very dramatic projects like uh, 
uh, infrastructure corridor from Turkey, nuclear power plants, instead of focusing on things we can control, like for instance environmental standards of industries, or the fact that we have 70% of new cars in Israel getting subsidized gasoline through their workplace, right? But, but um, uh, we, uh, we think that if you build infrastructures between countries, you make them interdependent, and, and this can bring peace. And we have absolutely no no precedent for this that there's such a thing as peace pipelines. This is another one of the the you know, sort of the, li the sort of terms we use about energy. Let's build infrastructures between countries; they'll be interdependent. No infrastructures between countries don't necessarily re represent interdependence. And you can have, for instance, uh, uh, the opposite: when the markets are not interdependent, when there isn't there isn't symmetry of, of supply and demand. Uh, you can have a situation where actually the pipelines only become a source of tension between the countries or, or, or actually or, or, or the weapon. Uh, again, either denying the market or, de or denying the supplies. So in, so in a sense, we also sh while we shouldn't look, we, would, we shouldn't be so afraid of uh, energy supply relations, on the other hand, we, we shouldn't see them as a panacea for all types of peace uh, relations. Um, um, I would like, I'd just like to make a... Um, Another comment also on it, uh, with, the, with the discoveries of the, uh, the, the large uh, gas deposits in Israel, the, fir the first term used was now Israel's going to become a geopolitical power and leverage his natural gas for geopolitical power. And I think also in this issue we should be very careful. I've just finished a volume uh, that's going to be produced by University of Pennsylvania Press called Export Perils about the difficulties that, beyond the resource course, the difficulties to countries that are export uh, uh, energy exporters. We always think that it's such a it's such a great uh, thing to have. You see how how debilitating being an energy exporter can be for economies, for governance, for education, for electricity, for almost every every sector. And actually, we have to look objectively that few countries have been able to leverage their energy export into geopolitical power. I mean, and actually among the more, the, if you look at, for instance, even taking the Middle East exporters, as much as we talk about the power of OPEC, these countries have not been able to even leverage their energy supplies in order to get what they want in terms of territory. <coughs> they have very weak militaries. They're dependent on external backers, meaning that uh, having, being an energy exporter in itself does not grant you any sort of <coughs> geopolitical advantage. And in fact, it, it can, if it's, a, if it's maybe over 40% of your GNP, it could be actually a complete disadvantage for your country because you have such uh, poor governance and such a, 